Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. Knowing what's important to you and what matters, and that it was the, like the creative outlet that led to so many other things, is ultimately like, I don't know, sometimes learning is painful, but you learn something as a result. Hello, and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Sam Feller. Sam is a mechanical engineer and has hopped around quite a bit in his career from structural to aerospace defense to medical to consumer, Kickstarter campaigns, Amazon Tulip consulting, and even running his own business selling panic button light switches and writing about engineering best practices. So Sam, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast today. Thank you. And you, I mean, you called me an engineer and I'm still an engineer on the inside. But I, I remember the day I became a manager and I was trying to help people like put some stuff together and I didn't know what to do. And I, I realized in that moment I had come had become useless. So <laughs> I still, I'm still an engineer at heart. It's still in there. And I like I, useless as an engineer, you mean? <laughs> maybe. Well but I like I like to think that I'm still an engineer and I run awkwardengineer.com. Uh but I, I'm now m- many things product manager program manager consultants like all sorts of stuff so those those are all evolutions yeah. of the foundation of an engineer that's I right think. so when you peel back once all an the, engineer always an engineer it's true when you peel back all the layers of the onion there's there's an engineer in there for sure awesome all right well even though you're not technically doing engineering work per se now i still would like to hear about how you decided to become an engineer yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people are influenced by their parents. Uh, so my my dad was an electrical engineer and my mom was a, I don't know, she's officially a mathematician, but if she'd been born like 10 years later, her job title probably would have been like software engineer. Um, and yeah, I think I knew from a, a young age that engineering was what I wanted to do. And I you know, played with Legos a lot as a kid. I don't know if that's something you hear often. Like every single time. But yeah. Yeah. Playing. You're pretty much guaranteed. Yeah. You're you're either destined or doomed to become an engineer if you play with Legos as a a child. So, so Legos, I think was a big part of it. Uh, Lego Technic, I definitely enjoyed a lot. And my high school, I went to a science and tech high school and it, it was shop class, but they, they had to give it a fancy name. So they called it prototyping and so I, I had a prototyping class in high school and i think that that enjoyment for like making physical tangible things definitely steered me towards mechanical engineering rather than other disciplines yeah yeah uh well tell us a little bit about awkward engineer i mean how did how did that idea come about and where did the name come from what do you do there et cetera, yeah et cetera. Yeah, I actually published a, a blog post on it recently about I called it the origin story. And I I don't remember all the details of starting the blog, but I, I started started blogging for for whatever reason. I, I had a day job as a mechanical engineer at MIT Lincoln Laboratory and I was looking for other things to do and maybe I thought that like blogging was going to be my my route to, to stardom or I don't even know if stardom's the right word for it, but but maybe blogging would be the the way to change careers, perhaps. And I, I think the blog made all of like zero dollars. So <laughs> I mean, there are gonna be a lot of swirling pieces in this story. And so like I continued blogging and I blogged for fun. Uh the actual awkward engineer name uh came from a conversation with some friends. And this like group of friends, we had this like little, we called it like dinner club or food club or whatever it was. And someone had no joke picked up uh, a pressure vessel and a CO2 canister like off the side of the road. So I live, I live in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is next to Cambridge, which is where like MIT and Harvard are. So 
to think that like you could just find one of these things on the side of the road at least there maybe like eyebrow raising but not like out of the question so <laughs> she was she was putting anything and everything she could into this pressure vessel and like pressurizing it with co2 and so you can get that like tingly soda feeling and she was doing that to everything so like you, you can put you can put melon in there, which has like watermelon, has a lot of water content, like strawberries will absorb CO2 as well. But like marshmallows will absorb some of the CO2. They'll also like squish down real far when you apply the pressure and then like re-expand when you release it, which is part of the fun. But like she was just doing this to everything. And so I think another friend said something like, oh, it's just a phase, it'll pass. And, you know, and that moment of time, I was also like, I was, I was young, I was dating, I was, I don't know, going on all these, like Tinder didn't exist then, but OkCupid was a thing. And like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm me, like I'm weird. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't a phase for me. This like awkward, nerdy, whatever <laughs> I have thing going on is just who I am. I was like, I'm an awkward engineer. That's just my nature. And so that's how I picked the name of the blog. And that, that's where, I love the name. That's, where, it's that's like where the name came from. Quintessential description of most engineers, right? We're yeah. all a little nerdy, a little awkward, yeah. don't quite know how to talk to people, yeah. uh, but we have fun. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, own, cool. I, own, I own the URL, like I own awkwardengineer.com. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a win. I, I just like having yeah, it. For sure. So has that been a full-time gig or a side hustle? It's, it's, it's been all sorts of things over the years. Like at, at various points, it was my full-time income. At some points, it has just been my income while also starting a company. Uh, I think throughout, it has always been a creative outlet for me. So the, the blog has remained. Uh, I absolutely like write and publish and put pictures for like projects that I'm working on. It has not like like doing full time product development and getting an income from product development can be can be challenging and I think I had a couple questions along the way of like am I an artist or is this a business and you know my my best product was the analog voltmeter clock which I, I had a Kickstarter campaign for is this cute little thing that had like voltmeter dials instead of like clock hands instead of like zero to ten volts. They went zero to 12 hours and another one for zero to 60 minutes. And my best segment by far was this like audio segment, like audio engineers. And I think if it was a business, I would have tried to sell more things to that, that audio engineer segment, but I wanted to do all sorts of other things. And so I was like, you know what? I think that answers the question. This is really, this is really like a hobby and a creative outlet. It's not a business. So my my day job at various points has been like I've been at Amazon as at a company called Tulip. Uh, right now I'm doing consulting work, so all sorts of stuff. Was that hard for you to come to the conclusion that this is an outlet? Uh, it's it's uh, your your artistry and not a business. Uh, I think I had initially hoped that it was going to be a business, and I was willing to experiment and try things. And so realizing that like the ongoing like sales and operation of a consumer product was like tougher than the Kickstarter campaign was maybe a painful realization. But I, I think it, knowing what's important to you and what matters and that it was like the creative outlet that led to so many other things is ultimately like, I don't know. Sometimes learning is painful, but you learn something as a result. Yeah, that's great. Um, t tell tell us a little bit more about the whole sales aspect. You mentioned it was even more difficult than the Kickstarter going out and and selling to people. Um, I, I imagine there are people listening to this thinking, "I have a an idea for a product. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've already developed my product. I have a prototype. It works." And it would be easy to assume that once the product is designed and manufactured, you're done. But yeah. you're saying that that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest things, like also I've experienced as a product manager 
is being able to make the product is usually not the problem. Like most companies at least get a product. It's the distribution. Can you continue to sell the product that becomes like the real challenge? And so the way I think of Kickstarter campaigns and what I like how I explain them to people is that Kickstarter campaigns are about unlocking the value of your audience. So I had an email list that I had built up of people who had seen like Awkward Engineer and other things that I'd made. Like I met them at maker fairs. I met them at like maker clubs, like, like really like niche targeted people. Like those were, those were my people and they, they read my blog. And so when I announced that I had this Kickstarter campaign, like I knew that it would be fine. Like I knew it was going to succeed because I had a rough guess as to what the value of my like immediate community and email list was. And so for the Kickstarter, it's easy to have this like one big push and announcement with lots of like energy and momentum and attention. But then once you've unlocked that immediate value of your network and you're trying to like continue to sustain it with ongoing like ongoing sales and stay relevant like that that's just that's just harder yeah and that's where the real grind came in for you huh yeah yeah and i think the nature of most consumer products i think i think i've heard like one in five ends up being commercially successful and so you can you can get various i don't know i don't want to say like movie studios take a tent pole approach where they develop a whole bunch of things, but only one movie like makes all their revenue. You know, I had, I had a few more eggs in one basket and I was doing it. I mean, this is what I mean. Like, was it a hobby or was it a business? Like I, yeah, yeah. I ran the Kickstarter campaign as an opportunity to learn a whole bunch of things. I, I learned the marketing for the campaign, but I also did electrical engineering work. I did firmware development work. I did mechanical work. I did vendor work. Like I did, I did all sorts of stuff. And so it was, it was partly for me as a learning experience and, op, and an opportunity for myself to like practice. Like I, I could have gone out and said, I've never designed a sheet metal part before. And I think I should learn how to do that at this point in my career. Or I can make this voltmeter clock, which is way cooler. And I'll have to learn how to, sh- <laughs> I'll have to learn how to do sheet metal as part of it. Well, I, I applaud you for having the insight to determine that it was uh, an outlet, not a business, because I think that can be a, an easy trap for people to fall into, especially yeah, engineers. We love to build things. We love to create. Yeah. And once the engineering portion is done, you know, that that's probably fun for, for most of yeah. us. But then getting into the sales part and the marketing part, maybe that might not be as fun for a lot of engineers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think there's a lot of like like personal analysis that the I mean, money pays for things for sure. But that's not really what's driving me to to do these projects. Like I'm doing them because I enjoy them or I wanted to learn something from them. Yeah, right. Um you do mostly management now. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, so product management uh, project management, and right now I'm doing some consulting work. So, typically, when a company gets to be like 20 to 30 people, is usually when things start to get really chaotic. So, if you've had, if you have like a, a young founder or a young CEO and a rapidly growing company who's never run anything of that size before, I I've learned the painful hard way how to run things of that size, like very quickly in intense environments at Amazon. And I would like to save you that trouble. And so that, what, that's the kind of consulting work that I do now. What kind of best practices can you share that might be useful to those listening? Yeah. So there were two things that really clicked for me. Um, so one person said something to me like, like Sam, you're running around talking to all these engineers and you're really cross-disciplinary and you're talking to them face-to-face, which is great, but it doesn't scale well. You need to build a system so that information flows to you. And I was like, okay, I'll think about that. That sounds sounds good. And then another program manager who was sort of mentoring me, I was asking him about like his process and what he did. And he's like, I just want people to distill the information down. I would just want to know, like, what do I get and when do I get it? And those two things together sort of clicked for me. And I was like, I'm going to build a system 
so that information flows to me and the information that I want is what do I get and when do I get it? And I think a lot of engineers and and managers for that matter, because there are a lot of poorly run projects out there, have never been trained to like think or communicate important pieces of information in that fashion. And so the what do I get and when do I get it? Like there's some follow-up questions, which is like, if I'm not going to get it when I was originally promised, why, what are you doing about it? Like, what are you doing next? And do you need any help from me or anybody else? And you can answer all those questions in about two tweets, like 280 characters is enough to provide all that information. And so if you need to collect a massive amount of information from a lot of people who are doing a lot of like, very rapid, quick moving things, just answering like, what do I get? When do I get it? And designing a system that makes it easy for them to like enter that information is kind of like core to my, my process. I, I like that a lot. That uh, does help simplify the communication. One of the challenges I have run into managing projects is um, mm. sometimes engineers like to tell you about all the marvelous right. solutions that they've come up. And, you know, rightly so. They've done great work and, and they're proud of it. Um, yeah. Uh, so from their standpoint, totally understand that. From a management yep. standpoint, you're talking with a lot of people. Like you said, you're trying to distill it down into – kind of bite-sized, quick conversations. Um, have you found any tools to like still help the engineers feel um, validated for the great work they've done, but also, you know, cut to the point, give me what I need, and then let's move on? No, I mean, like I I still express personal interest. Like my my status meetings are for like status and they go really, 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 really fast. I don't know how your audience is with F-bombs. I, I thought about putting putting a couple F bombs in there, <laughs> but my, my status meetings go really, really fast. And then the details and like the actual work that you're doing, like that comes up more like interpersonally and just, I mean, I'm genuinely curious and interested in the technical work people do. Yeah. So, so there's a separate, there's a separate place for that. Well, I, I have um, my own philosophy on project management that I think align fairly well, uh, uh, aligns yeah. fairly well with yours. Um, I see uh, it in the in the pre-show notes. Let's yes. get into it because yeah, I, yeah. I have comments. Go oh, for awesome. it. Awesome. Okay, great. Great. I can't wait to hear your comments. Yeah. Um, it, it comes down to basically three things for me. Uh, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for doing it? And when is it going to be finished? So. Yep. Uh, what 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 are your comments there? What what can you add to that? Does that more or less align with how you run things? So there's there's one like subtle difference. So if I ask like what do I get? When do I get it? There's sort of an implied who because I'm asking someone in particular for that. And then the the when do I get it answers the when is all this finished? But there's there's a question that you had which is what are we doing? And sometimes that can be tricky and misleading. And so the the analogy that I use is like, say you're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like, what do I get and when do I get it? Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's that's great. And if you say, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm spreading the peanut butter on the bread. Okay. Like that's according to plan that makes sense. But the thing that I care about is, am I going to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich ready for snack time when the kids come home from school? It doesn't matter that you're spreading peanut butter and jelly on it. And then what happens is when you get caught up in the what are we doing, like those those details of like spreading the peanut butter, invariably something comes up that throws you off plan and the what are we doing can change dramatically. So like I dropped the jar of peanut butter on the floor, it shattered into a million pieces like, what are you doing? I'm cleaning up the mess on the floor and then I'm going to go to the grocery store. Like that's, that's kind of the sidebar into like all these technical details of what happens that I think sometimes engineers can run away with. Why are you exploring down this like tangent or this path? But the, what do I get? And when do I get it? Like, well, your peanut butter jelly sandwich is now at risk for snack time because we dropped the jelly jar on the floor or the I, peanut I butter jar. I see what jar. you're saying. So you're, you're kind of shortcutting the what are we doing part and just going straight to, you know, uh, in your analogy, the peanut butter sandwich. It's the, it's the classic, um, I don't want a drill bit, I want a quarter inch hole. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And so as part of that status reporting, like what do I get, when do I get it, and then maybe like prove it. 
like what have you done recently what are you doing next that that answers some of the like what are you doing now what are you doing next which is like it's interesting to me as a project manager to sort of like put some of the pieces together and maybe do a little bit of a bs check like if if you were i don't know getting plates out of the cabinet and you didn't know if there was bread yet and you hadn't checked a whole bunch of other things and that didn't show up in your report. Maybe I'd be suspicious that like, I'm not sure I'm going to get that peanut butter and jelly sandwich on time. So you need that information to like verify. Yeah. But that's why I'm less interested in what you're doing and more interested in what I get. Yeah. Otherwise it might just turn into saltine crackers and that's it. That, that would be, that would be a sad snack. Although I like saltines. <laughs> who, who doesn't like saltines? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, any, any other best practices or kind of pro tips that you have picked up as far as management product or project? Oh man, that's a, it's a big open ended question. Yeah. Yeah. One or two, maybe of your, your favorites. Let's see. So, so the, the project management was what do I get? When do I get it for product management? Hmm. I don't know. I I really like talking about the for for product management. It's like when a situation happens, I want this feature so I can do something. So a lot of this might be a little further away from mechanical engineering and more towards software engineering. But I I worked with a lot of back end software systems when I was at Amazon. And so like a traditional like software user story, like there's a very traditional format that says like, as a type of user, I want to blank so that I can blank. And so you, you end up with these backend software systems and there's no, there's no like, as a user, I want to make sure that my database has passed a security compliance review, like, or that we make this upgrade to do, like no user would ever ask for that question. And so you end up writing these like torturous product management stories, which is really weird. And so my, my like big tip is you kind of, you flip it a little is like when, when a situation happens, which is often a technical situation. So like when we get like an inbound request on a certain port, like we want to implement a certain feature, which could be, I don't know, some sort of, we'll say a firewall or port forwarding rule, or I'm making up things now so that we can maintain compliance for our, our user. And so what ends up happening is you start writing these like plain English readable stories that say like, when a certain situation happens, we need to take an action to maintain compliance or to maintain security. And that action in the middle is very negotiable. Like there are a lot of ways to potentially solve the problem, but it makes it a lot easier as a product manager to say like, this is the situation, this is the outcome. And then in the middle is kind of like, this is the approach that we're taking. And I, I think it really helps for software engineers. And I think you can use it to a degree in, in various like hardware practices to get them to, I kind of want to say like, keep their eye on the prize and like communicate the, the larger situation and it it leads to much better like story writing and user stories and just because you have a back-end system doesn't mean you can't like deliver a useful piece of working software yeah yeah all right great well um i'm going to take a short break here and share with the listeners that teampipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment custom fixtures and automated machines to characterize inspect assemble manufacture and perform verification testing on your devices we're speaking with Sam Feller today. Uh, Sam, one of the things that I read that you wrote talks about learning tools versus learning first principles. And I, I have some thoughts on this as well. So I would love to hear you elaborate on that, please. Now, now I don't know what I wrote, but it, <laughs> it sounds like that sounds like something I might say. Uh, I, I think it's probably thinking back to like some, some younger experiences of mine. And like I was trained as a mechanical engineer, but being able to drive CAD was immensely valuable to me. And I found that understanding the tools that a 
deep level helped me think in other ways. So like learning how to use like mechanical CAD at a deeper level, I'd start thinking more about like systems architecture, like interface boundaries, uh, like stability of CAD models and how CAD models are designed. And none of that was ever covered in engineering class. But if you're talking about like nuts and bolts, like practical nature of being able to deliver like high quality work product, like learning the tools was just as important. And I encountered similar things, maybe not identically, but like getting into like circuit board design and PCB layout. Like I, I had some, I, I, I took the same, did you call them volts for dolts? the the ee classes for me i didn't but that's a good good title yeah i mean I, I i had a little more beyond what was in those classes but when it came time to doing like actual electrical engineering there were so many things that were built into the tool which are part of the practice of electrical engineering and part of the practice of making like a high quality circuit board had never been covered in class and so there are things like trace widths, like manufacturing tolerances, like board impedances, like all sorts of stuff. And sometimes I think learning the tool is an overlooked like portion of the education that you get in college. And one of the, one of the stories that I remember that I think sometimes applies to engineering is, is an old story about like machinist apprentices and, and being like a, a journeyman machinist. So you, you started as an apprentice and you had an empty toolbox. And as you took on more and more jobs, you need to buy tools to be able to like do those jobs. So like maybe, maybe you need like, like a sign bar or a level or I don't know, machinist parallels. Those are some pretty basic tools, but I don't know, maybe, maybe you get like more and more complicated tools for fancier jobs. And, and for some of the jobs, you probably have to make your own tools, like making weird sorts of like soft jaws and things like that. And so as your toolbox becomes full, that's how we can tell that you've progressed from being an apprentice machinist to like a master machinist. And sometimes I, I think as an engineer, there's a similar analogy as you learn more and more of these tools like simulation tools, design tools, analysis tools, like the more of those tools that are in your toolbox, like the closer you become to being, I don't know, senior engineer. That's a great analogy. Um, I thought you were going to take that in a, a little different direction. So I'm going to, I, I want to share yeah. something that I think is is helpful. Also, when I read this little uh, bit that you wrote about learning tools versus first principles, um, I, I thought more about kind of like the engineering fundamentals. M maybe that's what you're getting at anyway. Um, here at Pipeline, we, we do something called guiding principles and mm -hmm. supporting behaviors. And I think that's analogous to the, 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 the first principles and the learning tools. For example, th this all came about when um, – uh, we we got a new warehouse and this is where we do all of our building um prototyping mm. r&d type work and someone had food in there and our director of engineering says well hey you can't have food in here this is a uh, engineering workspace and we don't want to get the tools dirty and there's cross contamination to worry about no food in the warehouse and pipeline has always been um uh, kind of a, a a relaxed atmosphere um mm -hmm. And, and so people kind of pushed back. It, it felt a little, a little at odds with our culture in a way. And so there was some pushback and we thought, all right, what do we really care about here? Do we really care if there's food in the warehouse or do we care that we're keeping the humans safe and we're keeping the equipment safe and that we have a presentable space that we're proud to show our customers? And we, we thought, yeah, those are the things we really care about. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. where this this idea of uh, guiding principles and supporting behaviors came about. And so now in our, our in our warehouse, which we call the Reef, the Research Engineering and Education Facility, going along with the whole surf theme we have here at Pipeline, in our in the Reef we have this big mural on the the wall which has our guiding principles, which are things like keep the humans safe and mm. um, uh, have a presentable workspace and prevent 
uh, damage to the equipment, things like that. And then underneath them, we've got the supporting behaviors. For example, don't have open drink or open lid drink containers uh, in, uh, in the reef. And at the end of the day, we don't really care about the supporting behaviors. All we care about is that the guiding, the principles, guiding principles are, are followed. And the supporting behaviors are, are well, they're, they're like, they're, they're tools, you know, they're tools to mm-hmm. facilitate the, the end outcome that we really do care about. And that's worked pretty well and it and it feels like a much better fit for our our culture. You know, it's not mm-hmm. here's the rule, follow it all the time. Here's it, it, yep. here's what we're trying to achieve and here's some practices that will support that outcome. All right. Well let's see. Where where should we go from here? Um How have you leveraged relationships with machinists and, and machine shops to improve your own design capabilities? I think this is something that I, I had read also in one of your posts. Yeah, ma- machinists are the best. I, I love going to talk to the shop. Like they just, they, they know things that you don't and they think about things that you don't. Like, especially if you're a junior engineer, there's a lot of value in going to the shop. And I remember doing, call it some cost engineering. I'm not sure what to call it. I, we had a quote back from a shop and I was trying to get the cost down on the part. And I don't like, I don't like, you can't bully the shop, although I suppose some people <laughs> Good can. Good luck with that, yeah. Like, I mean, he says he wants to charge you this much and he say you want to pay this much. Like, that's very adversarial. But if you go to the shop and you start talking about like, what what is driving the cost? Why does it cost this much? And I think I learned at some point that they were getting raw stock in like 48 inch, uh, like 48 inch wide segments or something like that. And if I made a change to the part, they could fit two pieces on that 48 inch wide stock. But the way I had it right now, I was just over 24 inches and they were generating, you know, 23 inches of scrap or something like that. Mm, Yeah. And so it's, it's hard to get that information when you're looking at like just the designs itself. And I don't know all the details of like who their preferred stock suppliers are, whether they get 48 inch sheets or if they get meat like sheets and metric sizes. And so when you go down and talk to the machinist and show them the drawings and they start like talking through and thinking about like, well, here's how we might fixture this or here's how we might hold it. Here's like the work set up. And so when I can start to see like, how they're thinking, I can start making design changes. Cause I'm usually like my, my first thought as a design engineer is usually the intended application of like the engineering problem that I'm trying to solve and, and making it is unfortunately secondary. But when you go to the machinist, like their job is making it, that's the first thing on their mind. And so when you can get to them early and they weigh in on their concerns, like you can make changes and take advantage of their process and their process knowledge and just everything they provide. And I, I really think that that holds across all sorts of disciplines, like certainly for software development, like the importance of getting the like front end UX designer and the engineers to sit down in the room at the same time. Like I remember an example, like UX designer had put a couple things up there and one of them was like an explore is is an exploding folder structure where you could like click on something and it would open up and you know, the next thing would load. And so in the initial state, all the, all the folders were open and the engineer said something about like the particular the particular backend setup we had, like the underlying tech stack really couldn't handle, you know, that many things open at once. But if we could start in a closed state and let people open them one at a time, then we could, I don't want to say cache it or stream it, but we could, we could load the appropriate amount of stuff without overwhelming the system. So when you get into like the nitty gritty and you talk to people who are actually going to be doing the work, they take a different point of view than you do as a design engineer. And it's often incredibly valuable insight. And it, it's, it's like those casual little things. Like I remember talking to a machinist and I, I put a quarter inch radius on something and he's like, you know, if we got a quarter inch radius cutter, like you should really throw an extra 20,000 clearance on there for like chip clearance. And I was like, Oh, I, I, I didn't think about that. That's that I, I can do that. And so it's really cheap and easy to add that 20,000 clearance to what was like an arbitrary quarter inch radius. 
And then he was like, yeah, you'll make your machinist happy. And, you know, maybe another shop would have handled it differently, but like talking to the machinist at the shop that I knew that I was going to use or the machinist that's actually going to be making the part, like incredible, the insights that can provide. That's that's a great pro tip. I, I love that one. Make the radius just a little bit larger than the cutter. Um, another one I've, I've enjoyed is that if you're using two dowel pins to locate another mm-hmm. part, um, use one hole and one very one short slot. slot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's another gem. All right. Well, let's see. Um, you have made uh, you know quite a few kind of career hops. Over the years, what, what what were some of the highlights, and and what were some of the reasons that that you've made these changes? Like, what prompted you to move from from one position to another? Yeah, I, I I've I've done like some some personality analysis and like worked with some coaches and some people, and they they said that I I have a, a novelty seeking behavior. I have mm. a, I have a drive for novelty, mm. so I think I think that's part of it. Um, I've, I've left a bunch of jobs for having not great bosses, uh, which unfortunately, I mean, I think that's the top reason why most people leave jobs is I think 70% of jobs people leave because they didn't like their boss. I, I had, I had a, a bizarre experience when I was earlier in my career, I was at a consulting firm and I was unbillable 85% of the time for three years, which was wild. There were all sorts of other factors at play. Uh, Like there was some economic stuff. They were trying to spin up a new group. There was uh, an acquisition in the middle of that, which led to like a a hiring firing freeze. So there, there are a bunch of like weird extraneous circumstances to why I was unbillable for 85% of the time. But eventually, like I started doing so many other things because I was just bored. That's when I started doing some of the Kickstarters, getting into some of the other things. And I I left that job. I left that job because I couldn't hide all the other things that I was doing. It was <laughs> and also like like it's just it's terrible for your career to be unbillable 85% of the time. Yeah, that's, that's rough. Uh, that's part of what drove me to like do some of the projects. That's why I was like, you know, I really should learn how to do sheet metal by this point in my career. Or I should really do an injection molded part because I've had a couple of interviews where people ask me about them and I was like, I've never done one before. I've been unbillable for the last three years. So, <laughs> so yeah. Well, that, that's fun that you bring up novelty. It makes me think of uh, a book I read many years ago. It was about it was about mental health mostly, and they talked about depression as part of this. And I know I'm like going into this dark place. Like, how did we get from novelty to depression? Well, I will yeah, share yeah. with you. Uh, the the author defined depression as the inability to see novelty, which I thought was such a great, hmm. really interesting uh, definition of of the word. That is interesting. Yeah. Ever, ever since then, I've, I've thought because I I think I also have kind of a novelty seeking personality which is why being a uh, business owner is, is so great for me i can i can constantly go back and forth between different ideas and, and try new things uh for the business but I've, I've thought over the years that if 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 i was unable to experiment with all these different things these different ideas in my mind i don't think that i would be nearly as happy as as i am and mm-hmm. in fact mm-hmm. uh when i was laid off i that's how i started pipeline i got laid off because i wasn't very engaged in the work and i think that was a huge part of it i just i didn't find much novelty in what i was doing it was yeah. uninteresting and it it showed i mean i i played a lot of pool when i was in the office not billing hours <laughs> but there there was a limit uh, to that i i had to seek out and learn things it's yeah. just um, well, going back to Kickstarter just for a minute here, there are probably people who have ideas and they've thought about using Kickstarter. Any pro tips you can share about uh, running a successful Kickstarter campaign? So I think I mentioned earlier that it, it's really about unlocking the value of your audience. So I mean, the, the biggest pro tip is probably building building the audience and building a community ahead of time before you launch. Mm. Um, after that, I don't know. I I'd learn how to like ship and deliver and execute on projects. And that is, that is often the downfall of many Kickstarters. I don't, 
I don't have an answer to that, that question. Like, I don't know how to say like, learn, learn like all of manufacturing and engineering and product delivery to be able to like ship something. Uh, that's, that's a tough one. Maybe, maybe people don't know what markups are versus, versus cogs. People don't know that injection molding tooling costs a lot of money. Like it's jaw. It, if you don't, if you look at like a, you know, a plastic, a plastic fork and you're like, Oh, it's like 15 cents or whatever for the fork. And then you're like, yeah, but do you know what the tool costs for that? Like probably quarter million to half a million dollars, but they crank out like a billion forks a year. Like yeah. people don't realize, people don't realize what the tools cost. So that might be, that might be like my, my Kickstarter heads up is, is find out, find out what injection molding tooling costs before you actually like launch your Kickstarter campaign. Raise more money. Yeah. <laughs> I've Maybe, seen some yeah. Kickstarter campaigns and they're trying to raise, you know, whatever it was, X, X amount of dollars. And I look at the product and I think to myself, there's no way they're going to make that for mm-hmm. that much money. They need a lot more. But well, um, what, 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 Tell us a little bit more about what it's like bootstrapping a project because I I know that there were several things that you just ended up doing yourself because you didn't mm-hmm. have the money to pay for it. What what are some things that engineers can do themselves for free or for very little money that would be um, expensive if they paid someone else to do them? Like you know, any low hanging fruit that just makes sense to to DIY instead of pay for it. Uh, so I think I've heard advice that. For consumer products, up to your first thousand items, you might as well ship yourself. That it's not worth getting like a a logistics house. So that's that's definitely a, a DIYable item. Like obviously the the engineering time is something that adds up pretty quick. So being able to you know do some engineering work yourself counts for a lot. And then I don't know. I designed all my Kickstarters. Or at least, well, the the one successful Kickstarter. Most of my products I've designed to be successful in small batch, like like locally made, American produced, like small batch stuff, which is like something that I cared about, just being like like small and local. Um, I don't know if that's like a, a a hack or a pro tip, but it definitely like pushes you to learn a little more if yeah. you're trying to be successful from like day one. And you're also, so that's definitely like a a big thing for, for like bootstrapping is in being knowledgeable of production processes and designing specifically to take advantage of them, which I think is sort of the core of industrial design, which is like understanding the products or understanding the process and then designing products to take advantage of those process. Cool. Well, I just have one more question for you. This has been one of my favorites lately, and I stole it from Tim Ferriss. So I'm going to reuse it here in the podcast. If if you could put anything on a billboard that every engineer in the world was going to see, what would it say? Probably, what do I get? When do I get it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's great. I love the consistency. All right. Well, Sam, what a pleasure this has been. Thank you for sharing some time with me today. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, if you go to awkwardengineer.com, uh, there's uh, contact information there, or they can email questions at awkwardengineer.com. And then that's the, the awkward engineer, not awkward engineering. Got it. I don't, Got it. I don't know. I don't know who does awkward engineering. Ours is top notch. I'm just the <laughs> weird guy that doesn't. So questions at awkwardengineer.com. That's right. Perfect. All right. Well, Sam, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Yeah. This has been good. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.